and we are live on Facebook. So hello everyone and welcome to the Riverwood Conservancy's webinar, Climate Victory Gardens with Jean McWright from Blooming Boulevards. My name is Stephanie. I'm the Community Program Coordinator at the Riverwood Conservancy. I hope you are all doing well and staying safe. I want to say a huge thanks to Climate Impact for making this webinar and all of our recent climate focused webinars possible. Climate Impact's mission is to provide local climate education and action initiatives to empower citizens to combat and adapt to climate change to embrace a sustainable future. So thank you Climate Impact for your huge support. And before we get to today's presentation, we have a couple housekeeping notes. All of our May programs are now live on our website. So please register at the riverwoodconservancy.org slash events. On your screen now, you should see an entire calendar of virtual events for May. And this is a final reminder to purchase your own Black Bears book written and photographed by Dave Taylor himself. You can purchase a personalized autographed copy of Black Bears until April 30th, which is this Friday. So please contact Brian at 905-279 5878 or email info at the riverwoodconservancy.org. All of the profits from the sale of these autograph books will go towards supporting the Riverwood Conservancy's education programs. And before we get to our wonderful speaker this evening, the Riverwood Conservancy would like to acknowledge that the land on which we operate is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee Nations. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this place is still home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. And I will stop sharing. And today we have Jean McWright from Blooming Boulevards. Throughout her 50 years of gardening experience, Jean has focused on environmental conservation, specializing in native plants, woodland restoration, and naturalized landscaping. Jean founded Mississauga's exciting new not-for-profit organization, Blooming Boulevards, in March 2019 and is currently busy as president and executive director. She also is a horticulturalist, master gardener, and the director of Culver Leaf Garden Club. She frequently does presentations and workshops on sustainable gardening topics for horticulture groups, garden clubs, and public events such as Canada Blooms. Gardening is Jean's joy and passion, but more than that, she is deeply committed to advocate for environmentally sustainable horticulture practices. Welcome, Jean. Thank you so much. If you have any questions during this presentation, please type them in the Q&A tab, chat bar, or comment section, depending on where you are watching from. Now, whew, that is a whole lot to get through at the very start of uh, this presentation. Thank you for holding up. Um, and Jean, I will pass it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I wanted to say, uh, I, how delighted I am to be here tonight. It's just absolutely wonderful. It continues our um, friendship with Riverwood and Blooming Boulevards and Riverwood have a lovely relationship together. We've taught several workshops last year and we're teaching a handful this year too. So um, this is the first and uh, of many that we're going to be doing with Riverwood this year. And um, looking forward to doing the, the webinar tonight. Um, I'll share my screen now, if that's okay. Okay, that's great. I've got a PowerPoint for you. Uh, it starts with a bit of an intro, so hang on. Okay, so introducing Blooming Boulevards. <laughs> um, we, just let me. There we go. So what we do, Blooming Boulevards was founded in 2019. We're just heading into our third year. Um, and what we do is help people put the uh, grow native plants. And where they put the plants is on the boulevard or at the right of way near the street so everyone can see them. Uh, so we, it, uh, we like to be able to connect neighbors with each other and this is a great way up close and personal for people to garden, as well as um, share the message that pollinators, uh, pollinating insects in particular, and native plants are very important for our um, 
successful ecosystem services. So we grow the native plants ourselves uh, from locally sourced seeds. And we also do a lot of teaching. Uh, in particular, we link our gardens and we create a network, a habitat network for the insects to uh, travel from all of our patches of park land in, throughout the city uh, where uh, insects tend to get isolated because they don't fly very far, especially some of the smaller bees. So what they do is they use our pollinator gardens kind of like stepping stones, just like we use our streets as ways to get through to some to our destination, so do our bees and other pollinating populations. And we like to connect our neighborhoods to nature. This is the way we think of it. We connect neighborhoods to nature, we grow our beautiful flowers that we've locally sourced, and we share them with everybody that we can, that walks by on the street. Young, old, in their cars, in their strollers, <laughs> uh, walking their dog. And why do we do this? It's because biodiversity in Ontario was at risk. We have lost much of our biodiversity uh, in a very short period of time. And this is these are the facts just for Southern Ontario, uh, <clears throat> especially in the South Mississauga area where I'm located, I, I live in Port Credit, uh, the insects, the animals come across the lake if they're migra migrating uh, creatures uh, and looking for a place to rest and recoup from their long journey. And what do they find? Glass and steel and paved surfaces and uh, trees and non-native plants and there's no forage and there's no place for nesting or rest. So we've lost 98% of our grasslands and these are the places that have flowers uh, for insects that need nectar and pollen. Trees tend to be wind pollinated, so they don't provide very many services for insects that um, are nourished by pollen and nectar. Uh, what trees do though is provide shelter and forage for caterpillars, which is excellent. But we need those grasslands and we've lost 98% of them. And this used to be tall grass prairie where we are right here. So Blooming Boulevards has decided uh, that it would like to replace some of the 40 million acres of grass that we have. This is the largest crop. Now this is a statistic for the US. The large, larger than the three top agricultural crops, which are corn, so soybeans, and wheat across the United States. And uh, the statistics are some uh, reflect a similar proportion in Canada as well. Um, replace that grass, which is European. Uh, it does not provide any kind of uh, habitat for insects. You might get, if it has clover in it, then honeybees are attracted to the clover. But grass and uh, the standard Ornamental plants that people use for their landscaping uh, does not nurture insects. And I guess that's part of the appeal because then you don't have to be bothered with insects, right? There are no holes, no unsightly uh, um, pesky things to um, land on you and give you a mosquito bite or anything like that. But uh, there we go. And then we get a beautiful flowering border like these. Um, begonias and with a few boxwoods and uh, maybe some uh, canna lilies and other shrubs and all of these are European species that do not provide any kind of habitat at all for our native and pollinating insects. So where are the bees? The bees are here. Uh, this is my backyard native plant garden. Um, it used to be a swimming pool and then it was covered with mulch when we took the pool out and had a play set on it. And uh, our little granddaughter decided the play set had spiders in it and she wouldn't go near it. So we took the play set away and I at that point decided, okay, what the heck, I'm just going to plant a prairie, a little mini prairie in my backyard. And boy, am I glad I did because this is um, provides in much more interest for the kids in the neighborhood 
they all come with their little iPhones and take pictures of the, of the insects and they uh, do studies and they look and see what's happening. Uh, there's something new every day for kids to see. It's a wonderland. So um, that brings us to our vegetable gardens and vegetable gardens also are pollinated by insects. Uh, the, and uh, some insects are in particular specialists to some vegetables, for example, the squash bee. So the bees are also uh, instrumental in supporting our vegetable gardens because they um, provide uh, pollination so that we get more vegetables, uh, but also the pollen, the vegetable gardens are uh, supporting and native plants and vegetable gardens support beneficial insects, which kill those enemies of vegetables, uh, things like aphids and various other herbivores. Okay, so sustainability is no longer about doing less harm. It's about doing more good. I love this quote. It's not just that you don't do things that hurt the environment. It's that you do do things that help. And that's what we do when we put in a garden, especially a native plant garden or a climate victory garden. Now you might be wondering what on earth is a climate victory garden? This is a relatively new term. A lot of people have heard about victory gardens um, as they apply to the past. So when we, uh, when we start our, uh, our talk tonight, we're going to talk, see a little bit about the history of Victory Gardens and where they came from, where the whole idea came from, and then talk about the problems we have now. And because Victory Gardens were designed as a solution for a problem, that so we have a problem now, and that's why Victory Gardens are being revived, the whole concept of a Victory Garden, okay? Uh, the problem is different though, very different. So the way that we will be doing working on our victory gardens is also going to be different than the way it used to be. And I'm going to tell you about how the victory gardens work and why, and then we'll talk about what you can do in your own garden. So <clears throat> victory gardens were rooted in history. Um, they were advertised heavily uh, by the government in the media as patriotic, wholesome leisure. Why? Because uh, this was the time during World War I, which is when they originated. In fact, they were called wartime gardens or war gardens then. And in war World War II, which is when the term victory garden was coined. So this was um, to cope with the wartime food rationing. The food there, first of all, uh, food growers, were not available to work on the farms. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a few minutes, uh, but they weren't there. So there were fewer people growing food commercially and uh, more food was needed. People who couldn't grow food uh, where the war was actually being fought overseas. So resources were being shipped overseas. Um, the other thing is, is that there's a whole infrastructure associated with the production of food and farming. So that includes trucks and transportation and shipping and um, uh, uh, storing and warehousing and all of that. And those resources were also needed for the wartime effort. So uh, people were encouraged to grow their own food their own fruits and their own vegetables to relieve that situation. Uh, and <clears throat> here you could see one of the advertisements. There was all kinds of um, uh, inspiring photography and posters being distributed. So here are these lovely damsels in their cute little outfits with little hats all smiling. Oh, having a lovely social time. And instead of having tea and crumpets, instead they're digging hay and uh, mulching their garden. And um, here you see uh, that the, uh, the gardener is <laughs> uh, there. He's got a hoe on his belt. He uh, uh, is uh, <laughs> 
giving and he is inspecting his soldiers, which are all of the vegetables looking determined. And then the enemy plotters were the potato bugs and the black rust and the cabbage worms and things lurking in the background. Uh, this was a World War I poster. Uh, every garden is a munition plant. So uh, the gardens, if you grew a garden, this was, you were a soldier on the ground. Uh, your garden was like your own little army, okay, uh, weaponized. So obviously we're not doing that right now. So the basic idea behind first and second world war era victory gardening was shipping our food, shipping food, soldiers and munitions to overseas allies. Um, the gardens themselves were very successful. They were productive. In 1944 was the peak of food production. Uh, the war ended in, uh, shortly after that. So, uh, 2009 and uh, 209,200 Canadian Victory Gardens at that time, 57,000 tons of vegetables. So um, in two years, two more years, the war would be over. And, uh, and then, and what did people do after the Victory Garden? Well, uh, they moved back home they moved to suburban air law areas. Uh, the cities expanded and big business took over the land. Um, industrial agriculture was born and also the fast food industry. So we don't want that to happen now. Here's a, this is a seed distribution area. And a giant cabbage that people made. Okay, lots of work was involved here. Uh, the health aspect was an important part of the Victory Garden, but you were going to be healthy so that you could produce more food. And but the um, there were standards for health and good eating that were uh, came about at that time. So the ideal victory garden was one that transformed urban land into agricultural space. And that is an idea that we were picking up on today because we've got a lot of land um, being used that uh, being not used for anything productive. And those are our lawns. And this is where we can garden and grow our own food. and everybody in the family can get involved right there at home where you live. So food is a solution needed. Um, we need food, we need pollinator habitats, and we need healthy soils. And this is the goal of having your own garden that provides more services than just ornamental. The problem is the need, this now, is not the need to supply um, the army uh, and supply uh, fighters overseas with sources, with resources, it's to slow the progression of climate change. And we want to start now. And how are we going to slow the progression of climate change? This is caused by carbon in the buildup in the atmosphere, which closes, causes global warming. And what do you know, but food, the plants, food plants, all plants, sequester carbon. They take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil and that's is where it stays for a long time. So we need to do that. We need to do that quickly. So the solution is to grow climate victory gardens. Uh, Rodale Institute has said that uh, the gardens, if everybody put in a climate victory garden, grew, started growing their own food and vegetables, similar to the way we did in World War II, that we could reduce the global warming by two degrees Celsius by 2050, okay? And that is significant. It's huge. So projective changes in agricultural productivity uh, in 2080 due to climate change, uh, incorporating the effects of carbon fertilization, here it is, in some areas, you can see the carbon in the atmosphere is an advantage, and that includes northern U.S. and in Canada. It makes plants lush. In the other areas where it's warm, 
carbon in the atmosphere reduces plant production and those areas suffer. There is a huge loss of food uh, in the southern US, in most of South America, you can see in almost all of Africa, India, Australia, half the world or maybe two thirds of the world is going to by 2080. And this is my granddaughter's lifetime. She's nine now. So um, it is of concern. Where are those people going to be getting their food? We have to be aware of these things. So that means we need to change or do whatever we can to alleviate climate change. So our global food system is a major player in climate change that contributes up to 29% of greenhouse gas emissions. And that is huge. The greenhouse gas emissions put carbon into the atmosphere. So <clears throat> one way that our victory gardens can help is that they reduce the input putting carbon into the air by having uh, eliminating the food distribution complex, all of the shipping and the trucking and the transporting and the labor force, uh, uh, which is just huge in these giant machines by having our gardens right there where we live and we just walk out into our big backyard and help ourselves to the evening meal. Unless destructive cultivation methods are changed, a recent UN study shows that we've got less than 60 years of agricultural topsoil left to grow food. So not only is agriculture putting carbon into the air, but also cultivation methods uh, are destroying our topsoil. So in 60 years, if, unless something changes, and this is a reduction of agriculture as an in industry, uh, we're not going to have any soil to grow our food in. And everybody's gonna be growing soil and um, their food indoors hydroponically or something. I don't know what's gonna happen. I hate to think of it, but we're going to do what we can because here's the headlines. Um, from Scientific American in 2014, uh, only 60 years of farming left if soil degradation continues. Uh, and of course, three little centimeters of topsoil takes a thousand years. It does, you don't just make so soil quickly. Um, it can't be replaced within a lifetime. Uh, uh, statistics in the Smithsonian Magazine from this year, the nation's corn belt has lost a third of its topsoil, and that has been evident from satellite imaging and looking at surface soil color to see how much topsoil remains. Uh, and that is now in 2021, what's going to be the situation uh, 20 years from now. Pretty scary. Tilling results in topsoil loss. Uh, it degrades the soil structure and reduces its ability to retain water and therefore it increases erosion. So the topsoil uh, uh, is stirred up, it gets into the atmosphere or it washes away um, and it re erodes. The soil becomes depleted of organic materials. It's parched, it, is, it, it dies. The soil is forever damaged. Uh, it turns into a desert. And so we are going to suffer great desertification um, in areas that now are fertile cropland if this continues. We've got to do something, folks. So once there are extreme weather events that cause from climate change, and that's going to manu uh, magnify the existing water and wind erosion situations and create new areas of concern. And this is what uh, the drought in, uh, in India looked like. And there have been droughts worldwide last year, uh, the most severe droughts that have ever been experienced. We need action at all level from the largest institutions down to the community and individual level. And this is how we can help. So what can be done to heal the soil? Okay, and the, the big problem is the depletion of soil organic matter, which helps the soil retain water, right? Um, <clears throat> what we do is we practice regenerative agriculture. And this is one of the basic premises 
of Climate Victory Gardens, regenerative agriculture. Uh, it uses the means of, re of regenerative agriculture, which means that we rebuild the soil organic matter. And so that helps to restore the soil's biodiversity, all those little creatures that live in the soil under, underneath the ground that help your plants uh, be healthy and happy. And um, because of those uh, the organic matter, all the little macro microorganisms in the soil, they die. Uh, they help to conserve the carbon and keep the carbon in the soil that the plant has absorbed from the atmosphere. They add nutrients to the soil and the plants grow much better. It improves the moisture retention and therefore it reduces, uh, increases soil permeability and it reduces erosion. So what we do is we try, we encourage no-till practices. Um, instead of plowing your crop under, what you do is simply cut it off at the top, leave the debris on top of the soil as mulch to cover the soil so it's not bare and gradually it will rot and provide nourishment. Um, you can actually mash down your crop. You can provide a cover crop uh, after you've done your harvest and then mow that down. Uh, but what you don't do is you do not till it under. And so you've got a thousand years of agricultural practices which, which uh, involve the use of the plow that have been are being reinvented much more sustainably. So what we can do is we use regenerative agricultural methods in our home gardens. We don't till, we don't dig, uh, we don't scrape up the soil and destroy those microorganisms at all. And there are ways to do that. And that's what we learn when we learn how to make a climate victory garden. So how it works, we're gardening now for climate change, not just for yummy things to eat or beautiful things to see uh, or just to provide habitat for animals, but we also have an eye on helping to support ecosystems in behalf of reducing climate change. So climate victory gardens reduce the consumption of fossil fuels needed for the commercial mass production and delivery of produce. And you see these fill, this cornfield here, okay? Well, that got here in this way. Um, you have uh, the energy inputs into corn production include the use of nitrogen fertilizer, irrigation, gas and diesel fuels, machinery, which includes the energy costs of manufacturing that machinery, the drying, the seeds and all the inputs that are required to produce the seeds, the phosphorus fertilizers, the herbicides and their production and the machinery involved and the trucking. All of this means that we have this huge, even more so, less food produced at more carbon cost. Uh, an enormous energy output in food production now due to the big industrial agriculture uh, farming methods. Okay, so climate victory gardens foster the reabsorption of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And this is the process of um, the of photosynthesis. It, the carbon photosynthesizes into the plants from the air. They take the carbon, the leaves take the carbon. Of course, trees are our most valuable plant for this because of how leafy they are. Trees, leaves are champions at intercepting light. Uh, they photosynthesize the plants from the air, uh, take them down, take that, all those nice sugars, glucose, that uh, where the, where that it's transformed down into the roots and the carbohydrates into the roots at the carbon, the plants break down it into organic carbons. Um, eventually the carbon is uh, e re respired from the leaves again and, um, and, and the cycle continues. And the leaves emit oxygen at night or in the daytime and carbon at night. They reverse the process. So uh, this is basically how it works. 
So almost, atmos almost all atmospheric carbon passes through the plants during photosynthesis. And here's another description of how um, the water is drawn up through the surface and it's respired from the leaves. Uh, the carbon dioxide is absorbed uh, by the leaves and transferred into sugars for the plant and carbohydrates. The leaves emit oxygen through the photosynthetic process. And there's another drawing that describes the whole process as well. It's interesting to understand, and I think it's pretty important to understand the process of photosynthesis and how it captures carbon. And I was reading an article, and this is going to be um, uh, a resource page that can be distributed to you as part of this workshop about the impact of this and whether this actually is enough to turn things around. Um, and it, given the scope of industrial agriculture and the, the, its huge impact, are our climate victory gardens going to be effective in capturing enough carbon to result in carb, car, uh, climate change? They will, the conclusion is, is that they will be effective uh, if enough people get on board. But what we need to do is think about climate victory gardens, not as a fad or a passing uh, gardening style, but as a whole rethinking about what agriculture is all about. And that's where we're kind of um, riding the wave of that interest right now. And the important thing is to keep it going. So this is just to show you the soil, soil food web. And you can see that uh, the green plants are the producers. They uh, die, they fall down, their plant debris decays. Um, that carbon is then taken and eaten or distributed and decayed and it becomes humus, part of the organic material in the soil. And then it is the humus nurtures uh, and earthworms and the various other organisms, the microorganisms like bacteria and the little fungi. fungi. Um, and then that is taken up. Uh, they interact in a symbiotic relationship with plant roots and help the roots, which exude sugar, uh, all of those little or, or, or microorganisms it live off the sugar in the roots and contribute soil nutrients to the plant. Uh, without, when you till, when you take a shovel, a plow or a shovel and you turn, take that quad, dig right into that soil and take it and rip it out and turn it upside down and scatter it all around. Goodbye, microorganisms and all your little creatures that are working hard, that have worked hard to set up their little populations and do their job. Okay, you've disturbed the whole balance of nature. Within, that happens within the soil. If you do it on a large scale, they're gone. The soil becomes quite uh, bereft of, 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 of its ecological function. And so then the plants don't do well, and then you have to put fertilizers on the soil so the plants will grow, and that is harmful as well. Okay, so this is an example of my of the uh, mycorrhizae fungi, uh, which are particularly adept at uh, processing the sugars exuded by roots, and it's this white sort of like um, uh, cottony material. And if you've got healthy soil, and you dig into your uh, soil and you take a look, uproot a plant, and you you'll see that you'll have this, that the roots will have this threads of white cottony material, and those are the mycorrhizae fun fungi. And they help your plant be much healthier and grow better because it can make use of soil nutrients much better. So organic material is produced when plants die down um, with animal manure, the humus from the plant litter, uh, and from the roots themselves that decay. So people complain about weeds, um, but weeds often have tap roots that can go down uh, deeply and make a path 
for roots of their of the neighbors, their their uh, plant community nearby, to make use of. And that's where nutrients and water can travel down much more deeply when you scatter through your garden something with deep tap roots. And this is why we think of gardening as a community of plants, because the roots are complement each other. When you have different kinds of plants put together, uh, those roots occupy different levels and layers of the soil. Some are tap roots, some are fibrous roots, and they all work together to help out their neighbors. So in your garden, your best practices would be uh, to take care of your soil. This is extremely important. Uh, you're going to grow food uh, along with your ornamental plants and you will protect biodiversity. So all of these are parts of the concept of climate victory gardens, no matter how large or how small they are. You're going to take care of your soil by, using, by covering up the soil, and you do that with mulch. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean going to the store, Home Depot, and buying a bag of wood chips or pine bark, okay? What it can mean is to take the tops of your plants once they're, once they're spent and compost, and you just use the compost over the top to cover up the soil. Or, uh, even better, you take, all, you take your leaves, you go around and do like I do and lots of people do, and that is gather up the leaves your neighbors put by the side of the road, put them in black garbage bags and let them rot, and now you've got some beautiful leaf mold over, uh, it takes a couple of months to make leaf mold out of your dead leaves, and scatter that around on top of your garden around your plants. It makes a perfect mulch, much better than wood chips and and, and bark. Um, take your sticks and, and tops of your plants and just throw them down and scatter them down right around the plant that made them. Uh, it decreases your water use. It keeps the soil cool. Uh, it prevents um, excess evaporation, especially when it's hot uh, and during those hot dog days of summer. It it, curves, it helps soil porosity, so soil does not become baked hard on the surface. Uh, it absorbs water better that way, so it won't erode. The water, when it rains, does not just run off the top and, um, and erode that top hard layer. It also, I should say, reduces runoff, okay? And by and that in that way it protects local water sources. So if you use compost along with your mulch, what happens is that worms and other organisms will work that compost as organic material down into the top layers of your soil. Uh, and what compost use does is more than just enrich your soil, it also helps to reduce um, waste. You don't have the whole infrastructure involved in the city pickup of, of waste. Um, it reduces methane uh, from landfills. It increases the quality of the soil and nutrient density of your food. Now, uh, many municipalities, and that is including Mississauga and Toronto and lots of municipalities now, do set out their green bins. So please do make good use of those green bins or else have your own compost pile that you can make. And then uh, soils in urban areas are especially degraded. When you have construction sites like this, what happens is the soil is heavily compacted um, or the soil, the whole top layer of topsoil is gone. It's been stripped away. It does not get replaced. The, the soil structure is forever changed. It takes, it's taken 10,000 years for its layers to form. And in uh, half a day with a bulldozer digging a foundation, and trucking this, that soil away and dumping it somewhere, you've lost that soil structure, the layer of soil. So what happens if you try and make a garden on this? Uh, the garden does not do very well. And this is where our 
uh, Blooming Boulevards comes in because we put native plants, prairie plants with deep tap roots that are clay sod busters. And they are excellent for breaking up compaction. Uh, they go down deep and find all of those soil resources, anything they can get. They're very thrifty in their growth. Um, and they are perfect for boulevards and street side plantings because for the most part, they resist salt as well. So that's a great way to recondition the soil. And then you add compost and organic materials to this. And slowly, slowly over time, you can rebuild the, um, regenerate, I should say, the soil. And that is what Climate Victory Gardens are all about, is by is re soil regeneration. Uh, it helps to know what kind of soil you have. So you can do a soil test. Uh, but the most basic form of a soil test is a texture test. And that's really easy to do. You just dampen uh, some soil. It's a few inches down or like, you know, maybe um, uh, 15 centimeters or so down and you scoop out a handful, uh, make a ball, squeeze it, open up your hand again. If that ball is formed, is if it retains its ball formation, it's got some clay in it. If it falls apart and crumbles, it's got, it's an excess of sand. Okay, and loam soils are between the heavy clay and sand, which are ideal. So your soil texture, I, I teach a whole workshop, by the way, on called Understanding Your Soil. So keep an eye out for that workshop. Um, you can see it on Blooming Boulevards. Uh, uh, we have it um, list, our workshops listed on our Blooming Boulevards website. And um, so we go into soil tests and and textures and how to understand it all. But here's a little bit more about soil because porosity is also very important. That determines um, how well your soil will, water will infiltrate the soil. Uh, so you can see the pore space in sandy soils is very large. There's a lot of spaces. The soil, the grains of the soil are very big and granular. In clay soils, those little soil particles are flat like little plates and they're microscopic. You can't see them with the naked eye unlike sand. Uh, they're very tightly um, packed. They're, the pore spaces are extremely small, but you still can increase the porosity of clay soils by adding organic materials. And you can help the absorption of sandy soils and you can help the soil re moisture retention in sandy soils because normally the water would just run straight through, okay, by adding organic materials. So the solution to a uh, water infiltration problems, either the soil dries out too quickly in sandy soils or it stays in there and doesn't soak in in clay soils and they become rock hard when it's, it's very hard to re-wet clay once it dries. Uh, the solution to all of that is by adding organic material. So Climate Victory Gardens emphasize the use of compost and mulch, like organic materials that will feed your soil. And uh, again, like I mentioned, compost is made of decayed organic materials such as kitchen waste, lawn and garden trimmings. It's mushroom compost is great. Uh, worm castings are great uh, if, they're, if you could consider those as manure. Um, wood chips and bark decay very slowly. So they're not really that useful for adding organics, but straw and rice husks, shredded paper even. Uh, make sure it's not colored newspaper though, that which has heavy metals in it. Manure is any kind of manure. Uh, some manure pack more punch, like rabbit and poultry manures are extremely powerful. Make sure the manure is rotted before you use it on your plants. Earthworm castings are fantastic too. And rain gardens can work really well. You can incorporate a rain garden. This can be part of your whole climate victory concept because they intercept water. Um, they keep your water from running off and they, uh, 
they will enrich the soil around them. Uh, if the water doesn't run off, it's better for your whole, the whole site. Uh, eventually, your whole site will be, will retain more water and uh, not dry and be able to withstand drought better. Not only that, it keeps that extra water that runs off your roof um, from getting into the city wastewater system. And then good plant choices also, especially if you're growing wildflowers or even your ornamentals so that you avoid, um, so that you're not having to water your garden during times of drought, use types of plants that can withstand drought. And the way that you can tell the plant has good, is adapted to um, not need water or minimal water during drought are small, narrow leaves, uh, silvery leaves, which reflect the light, leaves that are furry or hairy, which uh, deflect wind. They don't dry out quite as quickly. They insulate the surface of the leaf from drying. Um, and so this little plant is called, one of my favorites is called a pearly everlasting. And uh, I have these in my boulevard garden, which I never ever water even during severe drought and it does just fine. Plus the checker pot spot um, butterfly loves it too. So you can see the, the types of leaves that are roots that native wildflowers have. Um, and you can, even some garden vegetables are very deep rooted. Corn, for example, I'm, I'm sure that everybody knows about that, but even tomatoes are very deep rooted. Uh, what is to compare with this, let me see if I can get my pointer, is right over here in the left hand corner, you can see my pointer circling, you see this little piece of something and that represents the roots of turf grass. This is what your lawn is right here. The roots go down six to eight inches, about 15 centimeters, no more, okay? And um, as compared to the to prairie and meadow plants, which are uh, a much greater, much better rhizosphere, you know, the area, the, the life of the roots underneath the soil. In all of these deep-rooted plants, just imagine hundreds of millions of microbiota happily living. Okay, now imagine what's alive and functioning underneath this piece of turf grass. And there you have, there you have it, soil health in a nutshell, which is why we don't grow grass. Not if you're a climate uh, wise gardener. Grow food. So reduce the size of your lawn. Please people do that. Plant your favorite foods and share them with your neighbors. It's a great way to enjoy your garden and swap your plants. I, I have a shade in my own garden. So I grow tomatoes and things in pots and move my pots around sometimes, or I have a little patch of sun that's always sunny and there I put my pot, but I have a community garden. So I grow my vegetables there. There's always a way. There's always a way that you can find a place to grow some food, okay? And of course, this re reduces food miles. That's the whole transportation infrastructure around the distribution of food. Uh, it's much cheaper, it decrease, dis decreases your grocery bills, it encourages seasonal eating, um, and which is kind of an interesting concept, isn't it? We're not used to that, but I remember as a child, you couldn't eat, have blueberries. Only in the summer were blueberries and strawberries available. Okay, and, it is and the corn on the cob, that was very much a July and August thing, okay? So establishes a close relationship with food, and that's pretty important too, especially for kids when they're just growing up and learning about these things. Your dream garden. So now you say, okay, oh boy, okay, I wanna start. How am I gonna get started? Okay, well, first you sketch it out. Think about how much time you have to do your garden, okay? Uh, give it, give yourself a chance, give yourself a break. Don't bite off more 
then you can chew because it's really easy to get enthusiastic and then it just kind of gets away from you. And then it's discouraging if it doesn't work out well. So start small, uh, start small. Um, think of some, may sketch out a few beds, some or maybe a one or two or even some pots uh, or maybe just a little tiny plot uh, along the side of your house or, you know, uh, uh, take out a bush and make that make that area your vegetable garden. You can find a way. So sketch it out. If you just have a few minutes a day, consider a container. There's lots of vegetables that are dwarfs that will grow beautifully in containers. And some really interesting looking containers too that work well for growing small vegetables. Uh, so here's a few container gardens that you can see how they work pretty successfully. And then eventually, sometimes you get so excited and everything works really well, you, you get more containers and more containers, then you realize, oh my gosh, you know, I've got a little farm here. So what this does, people, is doesn't condition the soil, but what it does is it saves carbon miles all that carbon that would be used to produce these plants um, in gardens that are, uh, you know, many kilometers away, or maybe they're even in California or Florida or somewhere. Uh, and those, those vegetables or, and fruits are trucked to you to the supermarket where you shop. Um, so somebody drives to the supermarket to put the vegetables out on the shelf. And the whole process of food distribution is eliminated when you grow the garden yourself and just go out into your backyard and pick your head of cabbage. Okay, so look at your green dream garden. So uh, if, if you want to have something more than just a container garden or a balcony garden, uh, consider a little, a small plot, a small size plot. You can pack a lot of food growing in just a small, 10 square feet of something really small uh, plot. And especially if you've got some trellises where you can grow things upright, like your beans, for example. Um, you know, tiny gardens are great because you can get at them. Uh, this is also wonderful for children, gives children the experience of gardening too. And this is, these are, I like this combination of, um, comparison of the then and now gardens. And you can see that then you had rows of single, single species of plants. So all the tomatoes are together, the beets are all together, the chard and the beans are all together, okay, and so on. Whereas the now, uh, you have, uh, you have the vegetables, the flowers, and various other vegetables, you have things interspersed. So peppers and onions are together and zucchini and watermelons together and the squash and the marigolds are together with spaces in between so you can get in there and walk around and tend your garden. So there are different garden styles as well. Um, these are called keyhole gardens. It's a pretty interesting concept. Um, really popular in Europe these days. So this is good for hot climates. Uh, basically you have your compost in the middle and then that gets watered from the top. There's an opening and the compost leaches out into the soil. Uh, it's surrounded by a wall or some kind of a berm. There's usually a retaining wall of some sort and then your vegetables live in that. Another garden style are square foot gardens. And so you, this is a intensification. So you have to have really good soil for this. You've got uh, all kinds of different uh, plans for square foot gardens on the internet. All you have to do is look because you see a certain number of plants are good for each square foot. Uh, depends on the high type of plant. You can see the cabbage over here on the right, there's one plant per square foot, whereas whatever these are, probably radishes over on the left, you see a whole lot and onions at the top. Okay, 
Uh, the other type of popular garden style are permaculture gardens. All of these work as climate victory gardens. They all sequester carbon. They all uh, reduce the carbon input uh, into the atmosphere, output into the atmosphere by reducing the transportation and the production costs. So this is a permaculture garden and you can see a kind of like a bird's eye view of this garden. Got a little mini greenhouse here. You have, um, I think that this is, these are uh, some sort of a vine, maybe grape vines. You have some fruit trees. Uh, you have um, berries in the back. There's going to be uh, rhubarb. There's going to be vegetables. Um, and you've got, you've just had something of everything that's growing that where that's interspersed. And, and an adjunct of this, another version of a permaculture garden, there's all kinds of different ways that you can concept of, uh, that, that go with permaculture are called food forests, where you have, it's a treed area and in patches of sunlight, you are able to grow food. So more best practices that involve a little bit more sophisticated again, once you get started your gardening, add perennials and native plants. So then we put in our flowers that will help the pollinators and beneficial insects. Um, rotate your crops. So the, this is where you take a legume and you rotate that. Uh, you have to be careful. So there's information on the internet about what are what crop should follow what. Uh, there's some no-nos you don't want to, the plants that are incompatible with each other. So it, you need information about that. You can see in the back, there's a rabbit hutch and a little um, fenced off area. I think these people might have a goat as well. And people power. So you're doing everything. You're not using machines. You're not using big uh, gas powered mowers or blowers or anything like that. Okay, so this, this also reduces carbon. And um, for establishing your garden, you're going to want to put it in this, uh, the area that it gets as much sun. But I know that a lot of people don't have a lot of sun and that's me uh, as well. So there are vegetables that will grow in part shade. Lettuces are one, peas are another, but there is a bunch of others. Okay, and then if anything goes wrong, not to worry folks, okay, this is all a learning experience and you wanna keep trying. But the great thing is, is that you can work together with your friends and neighbors and all share and swap stories. There's a lot of information out there and ways to learn. Protecting biodiversity, you wanna grow as many different plants and feed the soil life with compost. Um, and plant pollinator habitats. And this is the soil tilling, destroys these horizons. So if you're establishing a new garden, try not to dig up your soil, instead smother that grass with cardboard and mulch and leave that down there for a couple of months. Uh, eventually you can plant right into that for so establishing new gardens. And then there's a little bit about seed saving. So if you're planting heritage plants, uh, or native plants, you can save your own seeds. Uh, sometimes it's hard to get a hold of good seed. Uh, I have in your handout resource page that I've got have available for you. I have a couple of seed sources. And um, this, these are just examples of uh, some heritage plants. So seeds from self-pollinated plants uh, are beans, lettuce, eggplant, peas, peppers, and tomatoes. And an example of a self-solid pollinated plant is the moneymaker tomato. Uh, I've grown this tomato, it's fabulous. And um, uh, so I recommend heritage, organically produced heritage species and get organically produced seeds. And cross-pollinated plants. Uh, so these are the ones that are difficult to save seeds unless you don't mind that the babies will come up differently than their parent. Uh, and that's all of these curcubits, uh, the um, cucumbers and broccoli and cabbages and cauliflowers, uh, your melons, and then your bulb type plants like onions and radishes, okay? 
uh, your and <clears throat> and then your um, your spinaches, some leafy plants too. And so this is an example of a squash, a kind of the Canada crookneck. This is hard to get a hold of these seeds, but it's a delicious squash. They have long necks, and they uh, were uh, are the ancestors of the butternut. Uh, the native specialist is the uh, Pepinapsis uh, pruinos. I don't, I'm probably murdering that pronunciation. Um, uh, our native squash bee. And that is our squash pollinator. Um, and use native plant species. There's my garden again. Uh, support native pollinators. Think like a pollinator. Uh, there's information out here. This is something that Bo Blooming Boulevards is all about, you know, and we have teach workshops on pollinator gardens. And use locally indigenous plants um, that have co-evolved with our local insects. Uh, avoid, please avoid, if you're going to plant uh, native plants, for example, in echinacea, please do not, please avoid the cultivars. Um, anything with a pom-pom head, the, all the different colors of the oranges, the yellows, uh, echinaceas are not attractive to pollinators. Remember that your garden's a part of an ecological community. It doesn't exist just to be there and look pretty. Uh, that's the animals see beauty in a different way. And so should we, um, after all, we're all share this world together. Uh, they, and year round habitat is also going to be provided by your pollinator victor, your um, climate victory garden. So that leave the seed heads on and all your little stems so that the winter creatures that need to forage for seeds can have something to eat there too. Relax and enjoy your climate victory garden in the end. This is my favorite part. Okay, and thank you very much. That's the end of our talk. Um, connecting neighborhoods to nature is our theme. Uh, we do have um, a website, it's www.bloomingboulevards.org, and I am happy to answer any questions. My email is info at bloomingboulevards.org. We have talks and workshops coming up. Uh, we have a native plant sale at the end of June on the 19th and 20th, and we, if you go to our website and sign up for our newsletter, it's free, and then it will tell you all about all, all of our activities. Okay, so Stephanie, I'm going to stop sharing the screen right now, okay? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jean. That was so informative. I love that uh, presentation. You were just so awesome. Well, uh, it's a huge subject. There's really a lot there. I only just touched this, this, the surface. So I've got to hand out with some readings. And um, if people would like to learn more, you can use that as a jumping off point. Yeah, we'll, we'll be sending those out as well. Um, but yeah, the hour just flew by. I looked up, it's eight o'clock. I'm like, oh my goodness. I was so, <laughs> yeah, that was just so awesome. Um, we do have a couple questions. Do you have time for them, Jean? Yeah, I'd be delighted to answer any questions that people might have. I can see the chat here. Okay. So. Um, so there is one question from Pinky who has asked, I think Jean mentioned that you don't plant in the same spot over years. I have a tiny sunny spot and I usually just plant tomatoes in there. Is that a bad thing? If yeah. so, what can I do to make it better? Yeah, so you, you want to rotate your tomatoes with something else. Tomatoes are extremely heavy nitrogen users. So you want to rotate your tomatoes with a legume, something that's going to put nitrogen into the soil, and usually that's a bean. Okay, the tomatoes and beans, and then the beans are followed by something else, and then that's followed by something else. Usually there's a three to five year rotation plan. It depends on how many plants you're growing in that same spot. So that's why you have several plants together. Or you can put the tomatoes next to your beans. And you know the, the three sisters idea. Uh, you know about that, the corn, the squash, and the, um, what is it? The, uh, 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 uh. oh, the corns, the beans, and the squash. So the corn is the heavy nitrogen feeder, the bean is the legume, the squash shades the corn, and, and uh, 
that's the idea anyway. It's it actually has kind of been debunked. <laughs> I guess it seems like it would work though. I it it does work actually. Okay, other questions here. Yes, Carol has asked, is a permit required to dig up a boulevard to plant a garden? Yes, it is. And this, it depends on where you are um, here in Mississauga. Mississauga has a great permit that you can download from the city uh, website. And uh, the permit, this is a amendment to the city encroachment bylaw. So it's, it's administered by Transportation and Works. Um, and they are very concerned that people do these things safely so that nobody is snagged by a plan as they're walking by or anything. <laughs> um, the permit's not hard. It's a single page permit and there is no cost at all. Uh, if you are um, signing up for a garden for blooming boulevards, we will give you 50 native, up to 50 plants we donate uh, and we handle all the pa paperwork. So um, if you'd like to go that route, just go to our website and sign up for a garden. That's so awesome. <laughs> um, another question here, are there any pollinator plants that grow well in the shade? Yes, yes, many, 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 <laughs> many. That's good news. <laughs> Again, I've got, I've got all that information on our website and I, I do a really, um, a lovely, beautifully illustrated workshop uh, called um, Native Plants for Sun and Shade. Oh, awesome. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, keep an eye open for that. Uh, and uh, uh, But there are really a lot. One of my favorites, well, uh, how can I, how can you choose a favorite because there's so many beautiful, wild columbine, um, wild geranium, uh, a beautiful one called Woodland Asters, uh, th uh, but there's so many. This goes on. One called Blue Stem Goldenrod. There just really are a lot. Awesome. And I just have two more questions for Eugene, and then we will let you go for the evening. Um, when purchasing soil, are there any types to avoid that aren't climate friendly? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Hard question. Uh, I have to admit that I don't purchase soil, okay? I use my soil. I still use the soil that I have and I build it up, okay? I don't know, to me, I, I don't like to purchase soil because at first I don't know where it has come from. Uh, I don't know how they got it. It came from somebody's topsoil that was scraped off, right? Okay, but given that, it's, sometimes it's necessary to purchase soil. So the answer to your question, is there a right soil or a wrong soil? Um, often you need to buy soil if you are putting in a raised bed, for example. Where are you gonna get the soil, okay? You have to buy the soil. So it's not, the source of the soil, it's the soil mix. And there are, there's a place in Toronto now, I, I, I don't have the name right off the, the tip of my head, but if anybody would like to email me, I can give you the name where they custom mix soils. So for example, if you need soil that's very well draining for your raised bed, uh, then they will mix then they will have give you they will mix up a custom soil that has a extra porosity if you got have a soil if you're making a bog garden or something that uh, that needs to uh, be very moisture retentive then they'll mix a soil for that purpose and these people um, provide soils for golf courses and all sorts of different restorations so uh, it's a really good company. It's a Toronto-based company. I can't remember the name, but we use that when we put in pollinator gardens and raised beds because they need a lot of drainage. Awesome. Thanks, Jean. And we'll be sending all your information and all your resources after this webinar too. 
Um, one more question, and it fits really well with what you were just talking about with raised gardens. They said, I have raised garden beds. Is this less climate friendly as it sits above our actual lawn and doesn't contribute to the ground ecosystem? Um, it, you know, it's, it is all relative. Anything that means that you are growing something other than grass, believe me, is climate friendly and a valuable thing to do. Anything more than, except for paving, of course, you know, <laughs> that's worse. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, in a hierarchy of value, yes, regenerative growing practices, which involve regenerating the actual soil are the best. And that's why I tend to try and work with my soil to improve it over time, planting, putting in plants that will be happy with the existing soil. And gradually the soil improves and then you put other different kinds of plants there, okay? That takes time, uh, but it works, okay? But if you, have raised beds, especially if you are vegetable gardening, because vegetables, of course, are not native for the most part. And you need rich soil, you need to be able to, um, to fertilize and dig into it and really do stuff with your soil. Uh, that's because you're always removing its produce away from it. So there, you've got to, when you remove those vegetables, the stuff that the, that vegetable garden produces, you've got to put something else back in. So it's really a different kind of situation than when you're growing perennial native plants. Um, and that's why the permaculture gardens work well, where you're growing native plants and annuals, vegetable uh, plants together because they form a community that restores you take it out, it puts, its, it puts stuff back in itself. Um, it's not the easiest thing to do. You really have to have a good understanding of the dynamics of how, these, how the plants work though. So that's why uh, there's a lot of material out there that will give you in that information. But uh, raised beds, gardening for your vegetables and even for your flowers is a great way, especially to sustain wildlife and to keep um, keep the that that big may, major you know industrial agriculture machine at bay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Jean. It has been wonderful. And uh, thank you everyone for sticking around. Jean will be actually speaking not uh, this upcoming weekend, but the weekend after. She'll be um, speaking at another webinar with us. So keep an eye out on our events page because all of those are posted there. As well, uh, head to Jean's page, Blooming Boulevards. I posted it in the chat and uh, check out all the cool stuff that they're doing and get in contact with Jean if you have more questions. And lastly, I would like to thank Climate Impact one more time for supporting all of our programs and making this webinar possible. Jean, once again, thank you so much. It's been amazing and so informative and I will see you very soon. Thank you everyone, have a great evening. Thank you for having me. Take care, it's been lovely. Bye-bye everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>